So I just wanted to take you through a case here. This is a child that just uh, had surgery about a little over a month ago for, for her hydrocephalus, but she initially presented two years ago with headaches, nausea and vomiting and neck pain. Her parents took her to a local hospital, but by the time she was imaged and transferred to our facility, she was lethargic with bradycardia. Um, and a colleague of mine took her to the surgery for a placement of an external ventricular drain. She woke up immediately and felt a whole lot better. Her exam only was notable for papilledema. She had normal motor findings, no other cranial neuropathy. Um, so she could, you could see here she had this uh, posterior of this large salamic mass that was obstructing the aqueduct. Um, we eventually performed an occipital transcentorial approach and subtotally resected the lesion. Yeah, most of it out, but not all of it. And it was a, unfortunately a, a H3K27M high grade diffuse midline glioma. And uh, she's battled that for the last few years with radi radiation, chemotherapy, and a few different clinical trials. But she returned recently with headaches and vomiting. And this is the progression from January to March until now in May. And, and she was having a, a frequent headaches and vomiting. And you can see that that, that Here's the picture here on the T1 on the right. There's this, the tumor is growing back and it's now obstructing the, the, the cerebral aqueduct. So we recommended um, an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Her oncologist wanted additional tissue like they always do. So we also were able to use a flexible scope to biopsy some of the uh, tumor for additional material. But the primary goal of surgery, the first thing that we did was the third ventriculostomy to deal with her hydrocephalus. And, it's going to take you through this. So this is how, again, after the setup that I described, um, this is a right frontal approach here. And the resident's going to make the burr hole here in a second. And then once, once the dura is coagulated and open, um, this is the stylet here from this navigation system uh, in the PLA sheath. And you can see this, you know, we're tracking real time through the, through the vent, through the brain into the ventricle to get us into the, uh, front the horn the right way the first time. So that's, that's, you know, see a little drop of CSF starting to come out. We're just barely in the ventricle here. Um, so that's, that's how it starts. The, the obturators are removed, the PLA sheath is open a little bit, and then the scope is in, introduced. Sorry, scope is introduced. And this is kind of what we saw immediately. So again, we wanna make sure that we're on the correct side. She's got a very large thalamus dried vein, Cori plexus, frame of Monroe, the septal vein is really diminutive. We didn't really see it very well, but um, it's just not not really there. But but we knew we were on the correct side, and you can see here that we're going to enter the the third ventricle here in a second. And really, it's apparent very quickly. You can see the mammillary bodies right here as we get things stabilized. Here's the floor, the tuber scenarium, infundibular recess, that pink color right here optic chiasm, the suprachiasmic reflex. And here's, we're just looking back posteriorly to get a look at the, the tumor there that we'll biopsy in a few minutes, but this was just a quick look back there to see what it, what it looked like. So this was a flexible scope, which we can take a look back. This can also be done with a rigid scope, but again, it can be difficult um, depending on, on the, where your burr hole is. And some, some surgeons have actually uh, used two burr holes to do that, two different trajectories to biopsy and also do the ETV. So the flexible scope gives you some added options there. So again, here's the, there's the tuber serum. There's the probe coming down, the blunt probe, the grasping forcep. And you'll see a pop. Actually, you can easily feel that, but you'll see it too, that kind of floor shutters. A little bit of smoke there, just a small bit of blood from the surface, but that's really not much to worry about. That'll oftentimes stop with irrigation, which is kind of running slowly in the background. And then um, sometimes if it's really going, you may have to use the cautery for that, but it's pretty infrequent to do that, or even tamping on that with the, with the embolectomy balloon. Here's the balloon coming down, so you can see it pops through the uh, floor, and we're just going to dilate this up here in one second, and, uh, and then lower the balloon again before we remove it. And there's a nice opening in the floor, but there's another membrane here that we got to deal with. So this is membrane lilicus, so you can see that in the way there, I think without, I mean, there's some smaller openings, but we generally recommend opening that as well. So I use the Bugley wire without power, just as a card, electric cautery wire, but it's a little stiffer than the, than the balloon and just made another opening, which we further dilated just to ensure that we had really a, a nice free opening to the prepontine cistern, as you'll see here in a second. And that's the, the ultimate view there, the, the prepontine cistern with the basilar artery pumping away the colivus here. And you can see the, Nerve vascular structures off to the side. So here's the surface of the ponds right here. 
And then when we're done here, I don't show the biopsy, but we kind of take a quick look when we're finished with the irrigation off. And you can see the floor kind of pulsating nicely back and forth with the cardiac cycle, just gives you a good idea. So that's generally a good sign that things will, will work. Um, so most of these children will go home you know, post-op day one or two. Um, she did very well, was discharged the next day. Her headaches and vomiting resolved very quickly. And this was four weeks later. So you can see there has been a considerable reduction in the size of her ventricle, which correlates with her improved symptoms. Unfortunately, she still has a, a battle ahead of her with her tumor, but her hydrocephalus for right now is, is not a part of that. Um, so other post-operative considerations, number one, imaging, you know, some, some get that. I typically get a CT scan usually the night just to make sure, but um, not always, um, just to make sure there's no bleeding. But typically when we're finished, we inspect the third ventricle, the lateral ventricle, and if it looks pretty quiet, then, then um, I'll oftentimes skip that. Need to watch urine output. You are making some manipulation of the hypothalamus. It's rare, but they can have some transient diabetes insipidus permanent uh, endocrinopathy is very unusual. Um, antibiotics are continued for like a day. Uh, some surgeons use dexamethasone to try to limit inflammation around the ostomy for a few days to let that kind of prevent it from sticking, if you will. And again, most kids are discharged home the next day or day the day after. Complications are pretty rare. Infection is very low, less than 2%. Um, hemorrhage, again, is also uncommon. It usually stops with irrigation or tamponade, um, but significant bleeding, if it happens, can be, can be cauterized. Um, but uh, if not, then the procedure generally would be abandoned and an EVD place just for external drainage. But the thing we worry about the most, which is fortunately very infrequent, is an injury to the basilar artery, um, so less than 0.2%, and a permanent endocrinopathy, as I mentioned, is pretty infrequent. So in terms of outcomes, if you look at all all comers, the failure rate at two years is about 35%, but most of those happen within six months of surgery. And, and success really depends on a few factors. Age is critical and also the etiology. And this was really um, an important paper that was uh, published in 2009, describing the ETV success score. And it's a very simple thing. This is something that you should, you know, on a neurosurgery service, keep in your hip pocket, if you will, or keep, take a picture of it and, and keep it on your phone. But it's, it takes into account the age, etiology, and whether or not the person had a prior shunt or not. And you can see this essentially simply add up the points. So in a 15 year old boy like this with a tectal mass, never had a shunt before, he gets 50 points for being 15 years old. He's got aqueductal stenosis. That's 30 points. And see, since he never had a shunt, add that all up, that's a 90% chance of success. So it's a very high likelihood that that would work as long as the other anatomic features, like technically you could, you could do this, as long as the prepontine cistern is, is sufficient, it's not dangerous to try that, and it's not um, contraindicated. And this, this score has been validated by other groups, and it really is a, a helpful adjunct to predicting responses. So generally, for less than six months, the results are not as good. At least 50% of those kids under six months of age will fail. And certain etiologies like myelomeningocele, there's a history of infection or intraventricular hemorrhage, again, are much less likely to work, but um, in conjunction with chorea plexus coagulation, these generally may, may have a better, better outcome. And again, the best case scenario is a kid with a tectal tumor, a pineal tumor, or aqueductal stenosis, where up until the point in time when the things finally closed off, their circulation of CSF was normal. So if you can restore, it, restore that circulation into the subarachnoid space, then, then it generally will work. Um, so if you're over two, the failure rate's pretty low. Um, if, if it does fail, you can repeat that, um, and it can be successful in more than 50% of the cases. And late failures can occur. This is not a, a this is a child that died of, a, of another coach had a tumor, but died of on oncological issues a few years after ETV, but this was the autopsy. You can still see that the ostomy was, was open at the time of her um, demise. So again, um, ETV is an ex really a, a, an effective treatment for hydrocephalus. It's important that you must identify the relevant anatomy before proceeding. And keep in mind that it's a deep procedure. You have an instrument deep inside the brain, so small movements and gentle, a gentle touch is necessary because you really don't want to be whipping that scope around inside the head. And this is another patient, it's the chorea plexus, you can see nicely. Um, you need to maintain control of that endoscope at all times, and, and you don't want to be advancing instruments beyond your, your field of use. So if, you know, the instruments, you can't really have that in there if you can't see the tip. 
Um, again, if there's a small prepontine cistern, or if the anatomy is otherwise distorted, then it may not be a, a good case. And this is just the, you know, I'm gonna go through this quickly, but you can see the tuber scenario here very nicely, the infundibular recess. Here's the, here's the floor. And eventually, once that fenestration is created, um, get a nice view of the prepontine cistern there. Basilar artery, we're just a little bit off to his left side. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.